I know there's a new movie coming out for Power Rangers, okay? But the original Power Rangers, right, came out in the 90s. But that's the American version of the Power Rangers, all right? There was a one that came out even before American. It actually came from Japan. <laughs> Ready, fire, aim, ladies and gentlemen. Jeff Koga here, and I am actually leaving uh, the office on this uh, beautiful, beautiful Sunday. I'll be talking about how to launch a business and how to get to your first seven figures, as in make your first million. So I want to talk about uh, making your first million and this concept called ready, fire, aim. Now, why do I want to talk about ready, fire, aim? Number one is um, I'm rereading the book, Ready, Fire, Aim by Michael Masterson. The coolest part about that is one, I've always thought that I was a freaking nutcase, like a fruit basket and a half, because I was always been a firm believer um, to to sell the idea first before actually uh, developing the product. In that world of Japan, right, that's not how you do business. You know what they do in business in Japan? You actually have to physical create the product first, and then you go sell it. Most creators, in my opinion, want to actually create the stuff first before you go out and sell it. Versus me, I've always kind of been like a hustler so as in like I'll go out and sell it you know first before I do the work why is because I've always thought that hey this is way too much energy to go do anything <laughs> if no one's not willing to give you money when that book was recommended to me ready fire aim by Michael Masters and I was just like I am not that crazy but you know what the challenge is I took the eyes off of that the funniest thing is every single time I went against the principles taught in the book which is ready fire aim not hey ready or aim 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 ready then fire okay <laughs> which most people do in business which is like they try to open up a business and they're just like well hey hey man we got to get this logo right hey man we got to get this website right hey hey, hey 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 let's go get that office space first oh, oh, oh no 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 hey let's let's design this office uh, you know hey let's get make sure we get the right computers right Right? <laughs> and, it, and people think that that is really part of doing business. Now, in reality, is it? Yeah, it's a small part of it, but I don't know too many people that have actually have gone out of business uh, uh, <laughs> on buying computers versus what Ready Fire Aim is all about. It says, hey, until you get to your first um, five million or so, okay, you're strictly your job as an entrepreneur and business owner is to physically um, just sell 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 when I was a kid right I came back from Japan and um, I had these magazines okay and this is when Power Rangers was actually really big I know there's a new movie coming out for Power Rangers okay but the original Power Rangers right came out in the 90s but that's the American version of the Power Rangers all right there was a one that came out even before American it actually came from Japan Right, so I knew about Power Rangers since I was a super little, 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 little chinito boy. Okay, so, um, so I knew about Power Rangers, and uh, when it started coming out, um, I would bring back these magazines from Japan. And um, one friend of mine, I know his name. His name is Paul Mata. Right, um, I showed him the magazine. He says, "Wow, this is super cool." Especially when uh, the Green Ranger came out. If anyone remembers the Green Power Ranger, they came out, and he was like, "This is super cool. Can I buy it?" And I was like, "Ooh." He wants to buy it. And this is when I said, ooh, man, maybe I can make some money off of this. So so check this out. So so what I decided to do was my mom had some like manila folders at the house, right? Probably for filing purposes. And um, um, I got in trouble later on, but I'll tell you the funny thing is that I took those manila folder, okay? Without her knowing, I, I basically stole it out of her file cabinet. <laughs> and um, I opened it up, got some Elmer glue, all right and from school and I cut out some pages inside the magazine and I slapped it on together um, I slapped it on together and um and then I said, hey, by the way, um, I got this. I got the picture of the, the Green Power Rangers, man. You want this? I'd rather ask you first because you told me that you want you might want this. Um, and then he's like, how much do you want for it? And I said, and then I remember as still as a kid, I said, well, how much allowance does your dad give you? You know, because I knew his dad used to give him allowance. Why? Is because his dad like sometimes would drop me off at home, <laughs> and I knew that he would give him allowance. So I'm like, "How much your dad gave you?" You know, uh, and and I think I don't know exactly what he said, but I, what I do remember is that he bought it for fifty cents. 
right? A quarter of a pick, you know, like a quarter of one side because it's a manila folder, right? Mom, look, no hands as I'm driving because I'm in traffic. Um, so, so uh, 50 cents, um, so quarter of a page, all right? Now, why is this important even now in the world of business, all right? Is it's the concept of ready, fire, aim. So, Throughout my life, I've always thought I was crazy because I would operate in that premise of sell the stuff first, sell the idea, validate in the marketplace first, and then collect the money and or get commitments from the people, right? Obviously, co collecting the money is better than commitments, all right? Versus going out and building it first. So again, since being a kid, it was, it was just a challenge for me, all right? Now, when I got the book after Chris said, hey, you know what, take, take a look at this book, I read it. I think it took like a week or something like that and I went through it and I said look I'm not that crazy okay so in the space of real estate something that really caught on for me was wholesaling right wholesaling is where you get contractual rights in a property and you sell the equitable interest in a contract um, for uh, a little bit higher than a premium now what does that mean in layman terms it means that basically you control the asset and you sell the rights to the control of that asset to someone else all right so it's like selling options uh, in the stock market um, Maybe that's confusing too. So, so to 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 make it simplify, <laughs> to make it even more simple, you know, easier. The way to the way to look at this is let's just say someone wants to uh, um, sell a Rolex, all right, and the guy or gal that uh, wants to sell it. Let's just say it's a gal, and uh, she took that away from her ex boyfriend that cheated on him, and the Rolex is worth ten thousand um, dollars, but she's willing to sell it to you for five thousand dollars because she hates her uh, ex boyfriend's guts. All right. So if you go up to the to the person that's pissed off at her uh, ex boyfriend that cheated on her, that's selling the Rolex for five thousand, that's legitimately worth ten thousand. I can be like, hey, you know what? Let me go ahead and write up a purchase contract to uh, get it under contract, and uh, here's a deposit, and I can go around and go sell that Rolex for seven thousand dollars and make the difference. Okay, from seven thousand to five thousand, that two thousand dollar difference is my profit. That's called wholesaling, right? So I do that in real estate as well. As I've done that in the stock market, which is stock option, is the same thing. Okay, so the concept is bottom line is arbitrage. Okay, so that's the term arbitrage. Arbitraging um, the lower price to sell at a higher price. Concept of so, you know, buy low, sell low, and you're wholesome. All right, so when it comes to ready, fire, and aim, I absolutely love that concept. All right, now let me give you two stories. And in these two stories, when one, we went forward with that idea, and then we stopped following that idea, and how that literally made the company go broke in uh, I want to say uh, I want to say six months okay the company had to close shop in six months all right so let's start off let's start off uh, one um, that I got involved on because why is because I believe that that company um, and the concept could go really really wide nationally and had a tremendous amount of upside so um, there's a time when uh, we decided to um, I decided to join uh, my old partners to bring in construction materials for our new construction home for our development projects for our house flips okay so we brought on we so so we went in and we bought construction materials from overseas and brought containers over now our first rotation when we did this right we used our own projects so we funded it with our own real estate projects which probably wasn't the best bet right which wasn't the best bet okay but why is because as we ordered our first container it we didn't get the material fast enough. And the fact that we didn't get the materials fast enough, um, it slowed down our project, number one, as well as the domino effect, okay? Because our project slowed down, we had cost of money. I'm talking about tremendous, expensive, expensive money. To a point where, well, at one time, we had over uh, $50,000 in mortgage payments to our investors, right? To our investors, and uh, um, we didn't have enough money to come in to even cover that, okay? So imagine the containers holding back our projects because, and got delayed at the ports, right? Because again, the stuff comes in, and then they have to customs have to go through it. And uh, Long Beach Port held onto the uh, held onto the materials, and it couldn't make it through uh, customs. All right, so every month we're getting hit by this, man. It was ridiculous. Okay, so number one, those two things was a challenge, but it still worked out. Reason being, the margin was there. All right, now. Well, we started to figure out, because I was brought on as a marketer, 
okay? So I went on as a the concept of ready, fire, and aim, which is number one, create enough market uh, buzz so that way to see how many people want it, and then from there, sell the crap out of the, pro, uh, uh, of the stuff, and then collect the money, and then from there, figure out which items you're able to physically sell. Versus, the other individuals believed at that time that they wanted to go do a brick and mortar, all right, to open up a store, and not only that, but was was uh, buying um, and wanted to hold inventory of the product. Which I said, no, nah, you don't need to have inventory. We just need to change the sales process, and then if we change the sales process, maybe even give bigger discounts up front, people are willing to put down deposits. Because here's where the numbers shook out, right? Let's just say the, the item is um, $100,000, okay? For easy sake of math, and if 100,000 is a way too big of a number, cut out a zero, okay? Um, actually, I'll do 10,000 for the sake of math, okay? All right, so let's just say a container or half a container is $10,000, okay, to bring in a 20-foot container, all right? Now, to fill it up is 10 grand, all right, of uh, price in China, all right? Now, if you bring that in, typically you can sell that item three times your hard cost, okay? Meaning that that stuff that comes in is about 30000 worth of stuff if you unload that whole thing, all right? Uh, most of the stuff may be three and a half, maybe four times margin, all right? Now... For China to start working on developing the, the stuff, okay, they only require uh, they only require a third deposit, third deposit of the ten thousand. So they need three thousand dollars, all right, three thousand dollars to get it going, all right. And then once they finish it, all right, then uh, they get another third. And then when it's in the actual dock, they get the remaining third. Okay, so that's how it's work. So it's the breakdowns like three, three, and three, all right, three, three, and. 33, 33, 33, okay? That's the breakdown of the math, right? Versus what we were doing and what we were selling to our other investors and developers as, hey, 50% now, right? And then 50% when it is, uh, when it goes on to the actual ship and it leaves, all right? That's how we were selling it. So now imagine if that 10,000, we sell it to one individual, okay? And we're selling three times, all right? So which is what? $30,000. We take half of that. What does that mean? We're collecting $15,000 versus we only gave a deposit over to China for $3,300. So that's still, that delta difference still gave us enough margin to even already have our profit in hand. So it was really, really a great business model. So that's why I was excited, okay? Keep that in mind, okay? I hope you guys understand that that numbers, how the numbers shake out, okay? Um, on why it's uh, really, really important to understand numbers in your business, okay? And... And that, and we believe that that will actually have enough for margin of error. If some sh be in China or something like that, we can fill in the gaps. Okay. So, the first round that we went, as I told you earlier, is was our stuff that we did. Okay, our stuff that we did. Okay, our stuff that we did. And um, and at that time, we got choked up in our projects. So I got really, really scared because I had investor money in there that I was directly connected with. Okay, um, that I had a relation. My partners did not talk to them, didn't even know who they were. I was vouching on it. I even personally guaranteed uh, myself to say, hey, this money is gonna be paid back. So if anyone has been in a business where, where it's a long sales transaction cycle, okay, and money gets money, money gets choking up, okay? It's about cash flow management. So I got scared, man. And it was it was costing a lot and and I did not want to renege on my promise, okay? So so I said, man, we gotta pay these people off. And not only pay them off, but because they were debt partners at a much higher, they were in a subordinate, uh, subordinated second, okay? So meaning that we had a first underlining loan with a hard money lender, and we brought them on a subordinated second, kind of like it's called a mezzanine loan, right, in the world of finance. So we brought them out as the mezzanine, um, and because of that, we're playing about two points a month on that. Right on that money, so it's really expensive. So, for the easy sake of math, if it's a hundred grand, meaning that it's calling two points, okay, it's costing us two thousand dollars on that hundred thousand dollars that we're borrowing. All right, so um, that clearly we borrowed a lot more than that, okay, um, because we had about probably about a million dollars worth of uh, money out on the second at two points a month. So, a million dollars at two points a month, do the math on that, okay, it was paying about twenty. Um, 
do do your math, okay? Twenty grand a month on interest on that money. So again, if you have a two, you know, um, if you have a hundred grand profit, right? Five months of going over budget, or five months off on a boom, boom, your profit disappears. All right. So I was projecting out, and I was like, holy smoke, we got to pay these people off. So what we ended up doing is, luckily, we brought on another investor. All right, and this is where you'll start understanding how hot potato and how the last financial collapse kind of happened. All right, so we brought on another investor to actually take out our subordinated second um, and to take out some of our first as well um, and brought them as an equity partner instead. So we brought them originally, so again, kind of layman terms, we had them as a debt partner on a second position, okay, um, high interest bearing loan, and then we brought on an equity partner, um, equity partner. We needed to make that up so we got we got we got the loan we got we raised the money okay we obviously painted a great picture of this I'll be upfront painted a great picture you know the numbers right <laughs> um, obviously if you're pitching it you always paint a great pictures like projections right we're gonna do X we're gonna do that right so we painted it because I wanted to pay off my investor that I was personally tied with I'm telling you this is I wanted to pay them off so we ended up raising raising the money from a different investor and we gave up equity in in the transaction we were literally on the gun because the company had no money okay we had no money all right um, so we needed to get bailed out so luckily we raised it um, we raised it okay I got my investors paid off we got the second paid off um, brought on new investors made them an equity partner on it okay I'm just being transparent and open about this and, and telling you this because it's so important to understand this concept the ready fire and aim for me personally at that time I was making money because I had my own thing going on which was I was selling digital information products at that time we started finding one way to sell stuff okay which was using email campaigns right so we started doing some email blasts it was tricky in okay now was it was it fast was it was it as fast as they believed it was no all right and which I knew that wasn't gonna happen because the partners at that time believed that hey we have such a great product that people are just gonna line up and want to buy that's what they believed okay total ignorance and arrogance and more of arrogance in my opinion right to a point where we would get in a heated argument always about that I would be like I would be like man like why do you think that your shit is so hot and I'll be like, and they'll be like, well, because I know, because I'm my own own customer. I, we are our own customer. Jeff, don't you get this? We are our own customers. So that's why people are going to buy this. And I said, uh, no, we're not our own customers. That's what I said. Because if we were our own customers, we wouldn't be starting this. And then we figured out one way to sell this, which was to do an event. We made money on that event. Okay, to a tune of, I believe, when I ran the numbers on it, um, it did over, almost close to about $80,000. It was over 70, I want to say like $76,000, right, in a 30-day cycle, right? Meaning that, one, okay, the customer made money on that customer because they went into the property and then used the customer's project as the showroom and then brought people on and then made additional 80 grand. So it was a good model because one, so then I made the suggestion says, look, you don't need a showroom. The showroom is people that you sponsor their projects with, right? I said, hey, just give them a discount and or anyone that uses the product, use their projects as the showroom to sell the next container and to sell the more container. That's what I suggested, all right? And kept on saying, no, 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 we need a showroom. We need to have that. Otherwise, we're not a legitimate business. Um, they, and they convinced themselves and uh, voted two to one. They did their thing. And guess what happened, okay? Sales stopped. Not only that, walk-ins didn't happen as the way that they believed. This inventory that they brought, okay, stayed stagnant. A couple things happened after this, all right? Is number one, they broke the cardinal rule on ready, fire, aim. Ready, fire, aim says what? The book by Michael Masterson, test the marketplace with the least amount of energy, least amount of money up front, right? Which we did. And did we make profit? 100%. It was so profitable. Why? Is because we didn't have a warehouse. It was literally three people and one sales guy. Huge margins. But what did we do? We broke it, which is we didn't perfect that one move, okay? You just need one move in business to get to your first million. Once you have one thing right, you use that and you beat the crap out of that. I did that in the real estate investing world, email marketing, right? I sent over in one year over a million emails to real estate agents to get fixers and deals. Here's how it got even more ugly. 
uh, six, seven months down the road, boom, have to close shop. Now, not only that, okay, that inventory that they ordered originally um, sat in there probably over a year. Right? Some parts went missing, some stuff got dinged up, and that company went poof, gone in less than, I want to say, two years. Great idea. It started taking off, but always the buck stops with the people at the top, and sometimes, you know, you get overly confident in your ideas and thinking that that's the reason why business works. No. No, don't get too cocky, right? It can change on you instantly. Final thoughts on this, okay, is that to get to your first million, all right, I'm talking about million, right? And why it's so important is because I don't know why people have this magical number of a million dollars. Like once you do that, you're like, oh, I made it. Well, not necessarily, okay? Because you have to know what business, what type of business it is, okay? Because if you're in a typical, typical brick and mortar or or typical business outside of like information publishing, okay? Information publishing is like literally selling air, right? It's the you're selling information between the left and right ear and digital products, so the margins are significant higher I'm talking margins are running like at a 60% margin versus if you're selling a physical product okay margins are going to be anywhere from 10% 15% maybe 30% pre-tax dollars me meaning meaning before you know taxes okay now if you're a service based business okay like in the photography industry maybe real estate like an agent or something like that right those margins are probably a little bit higher why is because you're a you're a um, you're active in your business and you're doing it yourself, right? It's like a service business, okay? So the margins are higher as long as you're going after a premium on that, right? So, but that's pre-tax dollar. So really, at the end of the day, if the revenue is a million dollars, pre-tax dollar wise, maybe after like. And when I say a million dollars, that's after COGS, okay? Cost of goods and services, okay? So um, it's thirty dollars. So it's it's. Clive, it's a little bit different, right? Cogs, you have you have you have revenue minus cogs, right? And, and then from there you have uh, kind of the net pre-tax dollars. Okay, so that dollar down here um, is going to be running at 10, 15, 30 percent. All right, depending on what it is. So even if it's a million dollars, it's only a hundred and hundred fifty thousand. Okay, so if you're running it yourself, it's a hundred hundred thousand or hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Right? Is, is that still good? Yeah, that's still good. Okay, don't get me wrong, that's still good. All right. Now, versus if you sell a million dollars worth of information products, okay, you're going to be running probably between the fifty to sixty percent, depending on how big of a staff that you have and things like that. So you're going to be uh, pre-tax dollars. You're going to be netting maybe five hundred grand, six hundred grand. Understand where you're at in the business because, again, for the construction material stuff that we were talking about, right? That business, because of the way initially when we launched it, is because we were middleman, okay? Meaning that we were literally an importer and we did not actually hold on to the product on the U.S. side, okay? And we collected money up front. And we were up front with the investors and developers. We were like, hey, dude, it's going to take about eight, eight weeks. But it worked out. Why? Is because a lot of these people that bought the stuff, guess what? They're doing additions or new construction. So with permits and stuff like that, it would take, you know, right, four weeks, four weeks, six weeks to get the permits and to get the framing up and to be ready to install the kitchen cabins, to install the vanity, they would be right at the six weeks or eight weeks mark, okay? So it was perfect business model, all right? But the problem was is that we got way too confident, not me, okay, the other partners, um, got way too confident thinking that if you have a what? Castle, like a brick and mortar, then magically you're gonna sell more versus the mystique and the way that we were selling it, and I was personally selling it, and the way our salespeople were selling it, okay, was we were selling it says, hey, look, we don't have a warehouse, and because we don't have a warehouse uh, and we don't have a brick and mortar, we can actually pass the savings on to you. Was that a true statement? 100% it was true. 100% we were true. So even if we were most most brick and mortar three times, we were able to do it two and a half, maybe two times our margin. Why? It's because, hey, we didn't have a brick and mortar. All right. So versus we got way too confident thinking that we can do something else. So look at your business differently. Take advices from outside and to a point where I reached out to other people from other businesses and got feedback from them. And they said the same thing. Hey, that's going to be the nail in the coffin. Don't do it. Don't do it. Why don't you just sell online? Everyone's buying online. Just make the experience better. But hey, Went against it. Didn't happen. So that's what I got for you, okay? Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, leave a comment below. Let me know. And uh, like, comment, and share. Love y'all. Take care. And bye-bye.